British Airways Flight 009. At 8.40 p.m., while flying over the Indian Ocean south of Java, a strange phenomenon suddenly appeared in front of the airplane's windshield. It was St. Elmo's fire, a natural phenomenon often seen during thunderstorms or near volcanic areas. This caused the flight crew to become anxious and worried. But that was just the beginning. The worst thing happened. All four engines of the plane stopped working one by one and burst into intense flames. Mayday, 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 British Airways Flight 9, we have lost all four engines. Mayday, 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 British Airways Flight 9, we have lost all four engines. The Boeing 747 was at risk of plunging into the cold Indian Ocean. Confused. Terrified. Then praying. And finally, accepting. What will become of the 300 passengers and crew? Will there be a miracle for them? We'll reveal all of that right after this. On June 24, 1982, at Sultan Abdul Aziz Shah Airport, Malaysia, after a long journey, flight number 9, also known as Speedbird 9 from British Airways scheduled to travel from London Heathrow to Auckland, New Zealand, is currently paused for refueling. Preparing for the next leg of the trip, which is a five-hour flight to Perth Airport in Australia. The flight was operated by a Boeing 747-236B, a model affectionately known as the Queen of the Skies. The Boeing 747 is equipped with four Rolls-Royce RB211-524 jet engines, one of the most advanced versions of the RB211 turbofan engine series. It is designed to deliver high performance and reliable operation for wide-body aircraft. There were a total of 263 people on the plane, including 248 passengers and 15 crew members. The captain of the flight was Eric Moody, 41 years old. He was known as one of the youngest captains at British Airways and was among the first to be trained on the Boeing 747. Notably, Moody had previously been a glider pilot. Pause for a moment. Please pay attention and remember this detail as for the reason I will reveal and explain it shortly, but it will certainly surprise you. Accompanying Moody is the co-pilot Roger Greaves, 32 years old who has been a pilot for more than six years, and a first-time member working with them, the senior flight engineer, Barry Townley Freeman, 40 years old. The flight details for the crew members are kept confidential. Although the crew is quite young, they are highly experienced in their profession. The overhead speaker is calling passengers to board the plane, getting ready to take off. The passengers look pretty wiped out after back-to-back -back flights from Bombay, India, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. In contrast, the flight crew appears very relaxed. This is understandable, as they have performed this task many times before. At exactly 8 p.m. local time, the airplane began to take off. The gigantic aircraft created a loud engine noise as it moved in a southeast direction towards Perth, Australia. Captain Eric Moody was the chief pilot of the flight. He piloted the aircraft to a stable altitude of 37,000 feet. This was also when the crew could relax and enjoy the dinner served on the plane. Up until now, everything has been proceeding normally. All the passengers are enjoying their trip. The first challenge, airplane flying over an erupting volcano. 8.40 p.m. while flying over Jakarta, above the Indian Ocean, south of Java, 
The Boeing 747 continued to maintain an altitude of over 36,000 feet. However, unbeknownst to the crew and passengers, directly beneath them, a volcano named Galungung was erupting continuously and violently. At this point, Captain Eric Moody had also finished his dinner. He temporarily handed over control to flight co-pilot Roger Greaves to go to the restroom. Of course, with his caution, Moody did not forget to check the weather radar before leaving the cockpit. Confirming that everything was normal and it was smooth sailing for the next 300 miles, Eric Moody finally felt reassured to stand up. All right, Roger, everything is still fine. Keep an eye out, I'll be right back. In the cabin, many passengers, tired, had fallen asleep. Anomalies began to appear. Swirls of smoke started accumulating in the aircraft's passenger compartment. Initially, it was thought to be smoke from cigarettes. However, to the crew, this smoke seemed thicker than usual. Don't be quick to question, you may not know, smoking on passenger planes was still legal in 1982. Then they began to worry that a small fire might be smoldering somewhere on the plane. The thought of a fire at 36,000 feet was indeed a terrifying prospect. The flight attendants immediately started searching for the source of the smoke. Back in the cockpit, flight co-pilot Roger Greaves and engineer Barry Townley Freeman were still intently monitoring the flight path, unaware of a major concern that was about to emerge, a turning point that would change the entire flight. Blue rays of light began to appear on the windshield of the Boeing 747. What's this? Look at this, the light looks so beautiful. Is it St. Elmo's fire? I don't think so. There's no thunder tonight, is there? Anything on the radar? No. Damn, it looks like we are flying over a volcano. Co-pilot Roger Greaves suspected the lights might be St. Elmo's fire, a natural phenomenon sometimes seen when planes fly through highly charged thunderclouds or volcanic areas. With the help of the landing lights, the two men were puzzled to see a thin layer of cloud surrounding the plane, although nothing unusual showed on their radar. I think it would be better if we call the captain back. In the cabin, smoke quickly thickened and smelled of sulfur, but the flight attendants couldn't locate its source. A few passengers looked at the aircraft's engines through the windows and noticed they emitted an unusual bright blue color. It projected forward through the propellers, creating a stroboscopic effect, an optical phenomenon that makes a rapidly moving object appear to be moving slowly or standing still when illuminated by flashing light. They were worried and felt as if something terrible was about to happen. When did it start? Right after you left. Is there anything on the radar? No, clearly there are no clouds at all. Noticing the unusual effect on the windshield, Captain Moody became concerned. Despite the weather radar showing clear skies, the crew activated the engine anti-ice feature and signaled for passengers to fasten their seatbelts as a precaution. Their flight was about to take a turn, for the worse. Inside the cabin, the smoke was becoming increasingly thick. It even began to fill the throats, noses, and eyes of the passengers, causing many to tear up. Aircraft engineer Barry Townley Freeman was still carefully checking his equipment. He smelled smoke, but so far, there were no signs of a fire in any of the plane's systems. The helplessness was evident on the face of the young engineer. And then the worst happened. All four engines of the aircraft ceased to operate, simultaneously. At 2042, engine number four, a Rolls-Royce RB211 started to surge and caught fire. The crew immediately shut down the engine, quickly cut off the fuel supply and deployed fire extinguishers. Engine failure number four, fire action number four, shut down the engine immediately. Start lever, off, thrust lever, closed. The instruments do not indicate a fire in the plane, but passengers can see flames erupting from the engine and trailing along the length of this Boeing 747. Ear-piercing screams arise, and fear and anxiety are visible on the passengers' faces. However, the light show has only just begun. And less than a minute later, engine two explodes and catches fire. Within seconds, and almost simultaneously, engines one and three catch fire. The situation becomes a severe emergency. Oh my god, I can't believe it, all four engines have failed. 
From the grating rumbling, the sounds gradually fade away, and finally, there is silence. Within a minute and a half, the Boeing 747 transitions from four functioning engines to none. The plane, which had been refueled just an hour ago, somehow stops working. It is now like a kite with its string cut, hanging in the air, before gradually falling due to loss of lift. Captain Moody immediately tries to push the airplane forward to maintain a safe speed. The other two crew members attempt to restart the engines. As far as the crew knows, no 747 has ever lost all its engines before. They must figure out why this is happening now. Without engine thrust, a Boeing 747 has a glide ratio of about 15 to 1, meaning for every 15 kilometers it moves forward, it drops one kilometer in altitude from its current flight level. The crew quickly determined that the plane could only travel a maximum of 169 kilometers and had only 23 minutes left. Without power, the plane began to enter a slow free fall. Currently, they are about six miles above sea level, with less than half an hour to restart the engines before it plunges downwards. Theoretically, when all four engines stop, the autopilot should disengage. However, over the Indian Ocean, Captain Eric Moody noticed that his autopilot was still on. The three cockpit members were confused and worried that what was happening was unlike anything they had been trained for. Yet in this tense situation, they had no time to figure out why the autopilot was still functioning. All right, restart. From the top, battery, check. On. Crossfeed valve, open. Fire switch, in. The standard restart process of the aircraft takes up to three minutes to complete. In the current situation, the crew knows they have fewer than 10 opportunities to restart the engine before time runs out. Remember that I had mentioned earlier, the aircraft can only continue flying for a maximum of 23 more minutes. Once more, restart from scratch from the top, battery check, on, crossfeed valve, open, fire switch, engaged. Still no improvement. The tension is clearly visible on the captain's face and the other two crew members. Sweat begins to drip and the atmosphere grows increasingly tense. For co-pilot Roger declared an emergency to the local air traffic control. Mayday, mayday, mayday. British Airways Flight 9, we have lost all four engines. Engine number four has failed. Try to fly the aircraft with the remaining three engines. We will guide you to land at the nearest airport in Jakarta. No, no, Jakarta Control. We have lost all four engines. I repeat, all four engines. However, Jakarta Air Traffic Control seemed to misunderstand the first officer English. They interpreted the call as only engine number four being inoperative. Fortunately, a nearby Garuda Indonesia flight picked up and relayed the message for them. Eventually, the air traffic control understood the urgent message of BA-9 correctly. At an altitude of 32,000 feet after reviewing the situation, Captain Eric Moody decided to turn the plane back to the nearest airport, Halim, just outside Jakarta. However, even that was wishful thinking if he couldn't restart at least one engine. Mayday, Mayday, British Airways Flight 9, turning left back to Halim Airport. British Airways Flight 9, radar can't pick up your signal. Set your transponder to emergency code 7700. Although the crew set the emergency transponder code 7700 to report their distress, air traffic control was still unable to locate the Boeing on their radar screens. Now, the crew had to navigate back to the airport in a situation where the radar could not find them. A heavy atmosphere enveloped the entire passenger cabin. Without the continuous roar of the engines, everything became eerily quiet. The passengers could feel the airplane starting to descend, even though there was no communication from the cockpit. A few sobs from women could be heard. The rest tried to stay calm, but their stiff posture and tense faces clearly showed they were in extreme fear. Difficulties. Compounding difficulties. To have the best chance of restarting the engines, Captain Eric Moody had to fly the airplane at speeds between 290 and 310 miles per hour. However, the speedometer was not working, so the crew did not know at what speed they were traveling. From that moment on, Eric Moody varied the speed within about a 100 nautical mile range, hoping that at some point the plane would achieve the correct speed. 
Eric Moody turned off the autopilot. He then slowly raised the nose of the plane to slow it down and pushed it down to accelerate. Yet, shortly after, another problem occurred, as an alarm suddenly sounded. Pressure warning, Captain, pressure warning. Besides providing electrical power, the engines on the huge jet also help maintain cabin pressure. With the engines not functioning, air was not being pumped in, leading to a gradual loss of pressure. The thin oxygen levels caused passengers to suffocate. Oxygen masks immediately dropped down to compensate for the lack of air. Crew members also quickly reached for their oxygen masks. However, co-pilot Roger Greaves' mask was broken. The hose had detached from the rest of the mask. This meant that he would gradually lose consciousness if not supplied with the necessary oxygen. Captain Moody once again faced tough choices. One was to decrease altitude to help the co-pilot breathe. The second is to maintain this precious altitude to make an effort to restart the engine. At the critical moment, Captain Moody chose to save co-pilot Roger. He knew Roger played a vital role in saving the current aircraft. Eric Moody quickly descended the plane at a rate of 1,800 feet per minute to an altitude of 20,000 feet, where there was enough atmospheric pressure outside to breathe almost normally. Co-pilot Roger Greaves tried to fix his broken oxygen mask, but he was still frustrated by the engine's failure to start. The crew attempted to restart the engine procedure once more. The challenge did not stop for Captain Moody. As the plane descended lower, he faced a grim choice. Ahead of them were the high mountain ranges on the southern coast of Java Island, Indonesia. Moody knew he needed to be at least 12,000 feet high to cross them. Moreover, if the engine did not restart soon, they would not be able to cross at all. At this speed, everything could collapse within minutes. The plane could crash directly into the mountains and shatter. If they wanted to avoid that, their only option was to turn back to the sea and try to land on the water. And of course, landing an airplane on the sea is very difficult, as conventional airplanes are not designed for water landings. In the passenger cabin, due to sudden altitude loss and from an emergency break, the passengers were also affected. They could not hide their confusion and fear. Although extremely worried, Captain Moody still made an announcement to reassure passengers and crew. And ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We are doing our damnedest to get them going again. I hope you don't worry too much. After the captain's message, the passenger cabin gradually quieted down. Perhaps they had accepted their fate. Everyone was praying. Surely anyone in this situation, believer or not, hoped for a miracle. In the cockpit, Captain Eric Moody and two colleagues continued trying to restart the engines. They knew they had very little chance unless they wanted to crash into the sea. The miracle finally appeared. At 2056 local time, it seemed God had heard the prayers from flight BA-9. Just as suddenly as it stopped working, the fourth engine suddenly roared to life again. Moody used his strength and prior glider flying experience to decrease the descent and rate. When the plane was at 13,000 feet, engine three restarted, allowing him to gradually ascend. Shortly thereafter, engines one and two also successfully restarted. From a near certain disaster, the now revived jetliner was operating at full capacity. The crew then requested and initiated an ascent to 15,000 feet, favorable pass through the high mountains of Indonesia. But things were not over yet. As the airplane reached the target altitude, the green Elmo effect reappeared on the windshield of the Boeing 747. The captain yelled, but remained composed. We have to get out of this. Eric Moody guessed that the volcanic ash was the cause of the engine problems. As they decreased altitude, the airplane encountered another issue. Engine 2 suddenly shook violently, causing the whole airplane to tremble. Moody immediately decided to shut down Engine 2 before it could cause anything more dangerous. Boeing 747 then operated with the remaining three engines. The crew lowered the altitude to a stable 12,000 feet and continued their approach to Halim Airport. The challenges continued.
approaching Halim Airport. Due to the impact from the volcanic ash cloud, the crew visibility was severely impaired. Therefore, they decided to perform an approach to the runway, almost entirely by hand. But it seemed it was not their day, as they received unfortunate news from ATC just before landing at Halim Airport. Jakarta, British Airways Flight 9, our vertical guidance system is inoperative. Repeat, our vertical guidance system is inoperative. For safety, the crew was forced to land using the ISL method suitable for bad weather condition, where the pilot cannot see the runway. They were only allowed to use the DME device to calculate the necessary altitude for the final approach to the runway. Once the corresponding altitude was reached, the airplane would fly along a glide path to ensure safety until landing. During this process, Captain Eric Moody noticed a small, clear strip on the windshield. Fortunately, it was not obscured by dust. Thus, the co-pilot could see the runway clearer to guide the captain. 200 feet. Captain 150 feet. 100 feet. 50 feet. 30 feet. 30 feet runway. Switch to reverse thrust. 90 nautical miles. 80 nautical miles. We have landed. Finally, the airplane safely landed on the runway ending a journey that seemed like it was only possible in movies. The crew sighed in relief. The passengers were overjoyed, embracing each other immediately. They knew they had just escaped the jaws of death. Tears fell again, but this time they were tears of happiness. Explanation of the Cause a series of questions were raised. No fire was found, so why did smoke enter the cabin? How could all four engines stop almost simultaneously? And how could they suddenly start working again? An investigation led by former Rolls-Royce engineer Malcolm Gray Byrne was immediately conducted after the flight. After numerous analyses in the laboratory, engineer Gray Byrne discovered the engines were coated with fine dust, rock fragments, and sand. After further study, he confirmed that the debris was indeed volcanic ash. A few days later, the passengers and crew learned that on the night they flew, there had been a major eruption from Mount Galungung, located just 100 miles southeast of Jakarta. As the ash cloud rose above 49,000 feet at night, the wind pushed it southwest, right across the path of BA-9. The dust in the cloud removed the oxygen needed for combustion to cut through the windshield, and also clogged the engines. When the volcanic ash entered the engines, it melted inside the combustion chamber and stuck to the engine internals. When the airplane descended out of the ash cloud, the ash solidified enough to break free, allowing air to flow through the engines as usual, enabling the engines to restart successfully. The engines were able to restart because a generator and batteries on the aircraft were still functioning. It had never been imagined before and likely no one thought that a volcanic ash cloud could have such a severe impact on an airplane, paralyzing a flight in such a way. An important lesson was learned from flight BA-9. Dry volcanic ash clouds do not appear on weather radars, which are designed to detect moisture in clouds. This knowledge has been very helpful for volcanologists and international airlines flying over the Galunggung area.